so just say your name and uh, and where you live. Okay, yeah, my name I'm Tom Massapolo. I'm from Haddon Heights, New Jersey, and I've lived there uh, most of my life. I was actually born in Philadelphia. Yeah, so my, my experience um, with the, with the Nightcrawlers, um, I, I tried to get to almost every concert they did. <laughs> I even went up to um, Allentown and helped them set up. <laughs> and the, the Allentown one was not well attended. There was only nine people, and I felt bad. It was real hot there, and uh, the, um, I mean, I just felt bad for the whole um, situation, but... Um, Wasn't it up on the third floor or something? You had to... Yeah, yes, I think it was. Yeah. yeah, and you had to carry all the equipment upstairs, and um, it was, um, you know, but we had a lot of fun. The stage was, crooked. The stage was on an angle, and... Um, we had a lot of fun, and I believe the car broke down on the on the their car broke down on the way home from the concert, and uh, we were trying to f fix it around two o'clock in the morning. Uh, I followed them up there, or they followed me home, or so something like that. But the um, I tried to go to as many of their concerts, and um, because I felt that when the the uh, they were different live, I mean the tapes were all done live as well. Um, they, I mean, they eventually, like, they went into um, the studio, but not very often. Peter did not like the studio studio experience, and he had a JVC boombox that he recorded uh, most of his uh, material and um, for the for the Nightcrawlers. Now, Dave Lunt at home, he he recorded his own stuff uh, with a reel to reel, which was super high quality. Um, I don't know if he saved those tapes or the, of the type of music that he was doing back then, but uh, but really nice stuff as, as well. But the, in, in any event, with the the Nightcrawlers, I, I followed them to basically the end of their uh, career. We became personal friends and um, enjoyed their um, th their tapes and and uh, later albums and uh, CDs. Fopham where they played for the first time. Can you, you have any recollections of that? Um, it was 1979. Yeah, um, the Fopham was Peter and, and Tom, and and um, they um, they had put together something. They they I knew they were nervous when they started because I don't know if they ever ever played li live before. It was a first concert for them, but it came off uh, fairly well. It was kind of spacey. It wasn't real. Um, it wasn't as upbeat as. Um, I guess late, you know, later on, but uh, it was still interesting. And um, I don't know if that's the the night that uh, Peter left the cassette tapes on the radiator and they melted it during that concert. It might have been that one or, or a different one at the Taj, but it was around that same time period. But uh, but I got to meet them and uh, at at that time at least say hi and it, it really influenced me and, and I know it influenced uh, uh, you know other people. Uh, in the area that we're doing electronic music, Paul was Nicky and um, uh, Chuck Van Zyl. Um, it influenced um, influenced them uh, quite a bit. And uh, for musical achievement, I, I think the first time I, I saw them play as a trio uh, was pretty interesting with with Dave Lunt because Dave brought a, a whole different flavor to the to the band, uh, sharing leads with Tom. Um, and Peter doing uh, a lot of the, you know the, most of the sequencing work, so um, that was that was probably one of the most exciting ones, and I believe one of the oscillation zones um, where they did traveling backwards uh, it was just great. Um, yeah, yes, <laughs> I, I think I have uh, uh, all 35 of the uh, of the Nightcrawler uh, cassettes uh, go going back to the probably the very first one and um, uh, the, the sound quality was was pretty good you know for that time period and the way they were rec recorded uh, live like that so and uh, it was one interesting thing it was kind of funny because I remember something Tom Goltz told me that when he would record something uh, basically when it was done he didn't want to hear it again and he said I I'm done with this now I'm going to move on to the next thing I, I did it, it I performed it and I said well what about repeatability for a concert or something like that? And um, he said, well, you know, basically what they would do is they'd have the, um, um, you know, kind of, you, you'd, well, in those days, you'd, you'd have to write down a lot of stuff. <laughs> you'd have sheets and you'd have, you have, and put down all the patches and, and how 
you know, the settings on your equipment and, and that sort of thing. And he says, well, once, you know, Peter starts the sequencers going and uh, a certain sequence for a song, and then I kind of could do it from memory, uh, at, you know, at that point, you know, and the type, to create that, the type sound. And I kind of knew, I knew what he was saying, but uh, like when I was doing my own music, you had, I, I wrote down everything because I, I w would have a, a sheet and have the settings for all the, di the different pieces yeah, of well, equipment. They, they were just doing like, they really like to improvise. So right. If it came out different every time. Right, and he and they like that, yeah. And so, um, Pete or Tom invited me over to to play with them. So I brought my and I didn't think really I was worthy of the, of this. So uh, I said, yeah, I'd love to, you know. So I brought my gear over. I didn't have much, and uh, we played on New Year's Day uh, in Tom's garage, and um, and and they recorded it. You know, Pete recorded everything, so he actually gave me a little tape, which I may be the only one, one in the world that owns that tape, but actually put up me playing with the uh, the Nightcrawlers, which, which was kind of neat. Uh, all three of them, because Dave, Dave was there as well. And um, so that, that was, from a personal perspective, that, that, that was kind of neat. And it was, it was great. <laughs> when, uh, well, I, this was, uh, like I said, at that point in time, all I, all I owned was the little... Um, Electro Harmonix, the mini synth, the drum machine, and the and the tape recorder, and um, the tape recorder was basically um, uh, set up so I could play against a tape of myself. I was set, set up like a bass line on the tape recorder, and I had um, I, I had to kind of fill in because I didn't have enough instruments. So the, the tape deck served as like an instrument, and uh, and almost like a bass line, and I would play against that, and so that's and bringing the gear over to the, the night callers. I didn't know how it was going to turn out, but um, these guys um, were good enough to fill in like around me uh, or vice versa. Uh, I can, you know, kind of fill in. I had this little Casio um, VL tone, I think it was called. It was a little tiny Casio. <laughs> that had, uh, you know, it was real rudimentary. Um, yeah, there was no, uh, yeah, we didn't know what we were going to do, so we just, it was pretty much improvised. They started it off um, and um, was it all um, like uh, sound collage, or was there uh, some you know sequencer rhythms or drum? Um, I used my little drum machine. We started off with that, and um, um, I think you even hear Tom <laughs> laughing in the back because the drum machine's the tempo is real fast, <laughs> and uh, and so I said, "Whoa, you know the Nightcrawlers did not play at that time anyway. <laughs> they were not, they weren't playing fast. They were more in." slower in space you know when I play my own stuff I'm, I'm up to like 100 120 beats per minute so I, I was you know I had to tone that down yeah I think their, uh, um, their approach was um, I think what they really liked doing the most was sound collage you know just yeah. smooth space music. right and um, they added I mean they like doing rhythms and sequencers and melodies and stuff and, as well but uh, that is they, they seemed to pay more attention to that for uh, making concerts that were going to be consumed by an audience. But in their heart of hearts, I think they just liked uh, jamming with, uh, with with different sounds and creating atmospheres. Yes. Um, so was that, is that how that set went, or did your influence you gave it this high energy? Well, in the beginning, side side A has the drum machine. Side side B is all is all space. So. Um, like I started out with that, and then they kind of filled in around, and like I said it was like uh, like an improvised jam, and then um, and then the second part of it was um, uh, they were more in control of it with um, kind of like space electronics, and then I I filled in where I thought was you know would be appropriate or you know I, I got to remember I was I, I didn't have any. Um, Real synthesizers at that time, so it was kind of like a learning experience for me. To, yeah, to, so you know, it was very, that's all I had was one little thing. So you, um, so it was the January first, and so they must have had the kerosene heater in there to keep the. Uh, um, probably, yeah. We had kerosene heater, and um, it was the. Um, yeah, it wasn't New Year's Eve. Um, they, I think they, I think they played all weekend. Uh, 
themselves and, and they stayed overnight in the garage or something like that and and <laughs> told me to come over the next day <laughs> which which I did and then we then we set up in the in the garage so they just did like a marathon jam session so, yes themselves. yeah so, something like that and I enjoyed I enjoyed it you know and, um, and so that was that was pretty interesting so so back during the time period in the in the early uh, 80s the um, I guess that if I had to categorize it as the as the top uh, space music uh, groups uh, or electronic music groups as well but it would be the night crawlers um, definitely had a lot of uh, airplay and, and concert play at that time. Uh, Ghost Riders would, would also be in the top of the list. Uh, incredible stuff. Um, Charles Cohen, Jeff Kane. Um, and um, occasionally they, they may have brought somebody else into the group, different variations of that. But um, basically those two, two gentlemen. And, um, and Tangent. Um, was also very very instrumental at the time, enjoyable music, and um, and then um, if I th that would be my top three, and then uh, I'd have to also um, give thanks to the Paul Wozniki at the time as as Waz, as Waz was experimenting with all different uh, formations of his group as well, not solo as well as bringing other people in. If I had to group them a, a certain way, th yeah, they were electronic slash space music but they all had unique sounds and and the whole this whole scene I still believe a lot of it was unique to the Philadelphia area uh, I've talked to other people about it and uh, uh, you know people who were disc jockeys and and people that were playing the music and selling the music back then and uh, that I've I felt that it was um, I don't I can't speak for the rest of the country but I don't know that they had a strong um, music scene when I you know, when I would go on vacation, I wouldn't find, uh, I'd go to cities, they would, they never even heard of this kind of music, let alone the artists. Yeah, I mean, listening to electronic music, it, it, it kind of gives you a, a, a spiritual lift, um, and that it's fun to listen to, it's fun to play, and um, it's just you know, something I enjoy along with, you know, other types of music as well but um, it's it's unique in that um, I think it's probably uh, one of the more you know creative sides of, uh, of music <laughs>